Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this session, Unlocking Digital and AI Technology for Health. I'm delighted that you are all here to join us in the room and we know we have also uh, quite a few people joining globally um, for this session online. Uh, it's part of the digital track of the World Health Summit and I really want to applaud the World Health Summit for having recognized the importance of digital health, digital transformation of health systems for several years and has become an increasing priority for the World Health Summit. But I would say even then, this year is you know, an exception because it plays a very dominant and prominent role in, in this World Health Summit quite appropriately because we all, I think, recognize the enormous potential of digital transformation for health systems around the world but also particularly in the Global South, as a kind of key enabler and accelerator towards the common goal of reaching universal health coverage by the year 2030. And we do believe without digital transformation, this will not be possible. At the same time, we also are aware that this will not happen automatically. And, you know, digital transformation also has some risks. It can potentially also increase the digital divide. And it is not a given that everybody in every country will benefit from the potential of digital transformation. Therefore, we had already you know, a very important event here during the World Health Summit, <clears throat> which was yesterday the launch of the Lancet FT report, Governing Health Futures by the year 2030, growing up in a digital world. This has been launched here two years ago, and now we've seen the kind of final report, and that will be extremely important to kind of provide the framework in which, you know, digital transformation should happen. And we have, you know, a commissioner on the panel with Dr. Sumia, who will speak later on, of course, for WHO, but, but also, you know, has been um, a panelist. And we have other panelists here in the room. One of them is also Dr. Amandip Gill, the CEO of IDARE, the International Digital Health and AI Research Collaborative. And IDARE, as you could see from the screen, is a co-sponsor, co-host of this session. So allow me a few words about IDER because it is a new international platform for inclusive, impactful, and responsible research and development for digital technology in health. And we do believe that this is a very important component. There are many components that will be required to promote digital health, digital transformation, but research and development is certainly one of them, particularly research and development that has a focus, a strong focus on promoting digital transformation in the Global South. It's a global program with regional hubs, uh, but with making research and development, you know, that is particularly focused um, on countries that require this support. And it is very complementary um, to the work of WHO. Um, and so you could comment on that if you like, but you know, it has always been designed and has been in an incubation period for two years as being complementing the very important work of, of WHO. So, um, with that, um, I would like to introduce um, our very distinguished panel. I'm extremely delighted, you know, who has agreed to join us today um, for this discussion. Um, you know, very experienced senior representatives looking at it from, from different perspectives. Um, and I think that is very important. And I will introduce the speakers one by one, as I, you know, ask you to make your first comment. Um, and then we will have uh, a joint discussion after that. So uh, let me first start with Dr. Anne Ertz, you know, who has been a leader in this field, you know, for, for many, many years. And is the head of the Novartis Foundation and, you know, has been here at the World Health Summit and, you know, um, been a recognized leader in this. And we are sorry that you can't be with us today in, in person, but we are delighted that, that you agreed to, to join us um, from Basel. Um, she is also, you know, co-chairing the, the, the working group of the Broadband Commission, which is a very, very important um, institution, if you like, that has been promoting this for, for many years. And we are very grateful that, that you're joining us today. And so I would hand over to you uh, for the first uh, contribution, please. Thank you so much, Christoph, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you and uh, distinguished panelist. I'm re I really regret I cannot meet you in person. I would have loved to. Um, I hope uh, next year we can be together again. 
So thank you, Christoph, for giving me the floor first. And in fact, um, I think what you just said is really uh, highlighting the, the urgent need for us to do things differently. With all the current challenges we face in the, in the field of global health, we need to re-engineer or reorganize the way we deliver health and care around the world and help our health systems to become, instead of being these reactive care systems that wait for people to get sick, to become more proactive, predictive, and ultimately preventive so that they can keep their people healthy. And what better opportunity do we have than the fact that we live in a, a digital era to have digital transformation for uh, health and care as well. And in fact, with the Broadband Commission Working Group on uh, AI and health that we ran last year, we saw how digital and AI-driven innovations have a tremendous impact on health of the populations around the world already. And through a through, um, comprehensive landscape analysis, we distilled the real insights that led us to understand what is the roadmap countries have to engage in to build an entire ecosystem to be ready to deploy these innovative technologies in their health systems. And of course, data and infrastructure are absolutely important. You need to get broadband connection and to have the right data to, to tap into the potential of artificial intelligence, for example. But that's not the only thing. In fact, countries have to invest in an entire ecosystem to be advancing on their readiness to deploy AI-driven solutions, for example. And the first area countries have to invest in is in the skills of their people, of their workforce and their government leaders, both in the field of digital and data science, because that's what is currently needed to advance faster and work on this digital transformation moving forward. Secondly, besides, again, data and infrastructure, we need strong governance and regulatory systems, and that's obviously key for every country to keep their population safe and the data private enough um, so that innovations can be rolled out without problems. And then you need to think about who will use the innovations and do they really respond to a, a priority need in the country? Because if you come with a solution-driven approach, um, these innovations will never get to scale. That's what we have experienced around the world over and over again. So you need to include the needs of the one who will use the innovation and definitely listen to health authorities' priority needs before coming with a ready-made solution and then build that solution together. Leave the decision makers in the, in the driver's seat is a golden rule. And lastly, governments have to build these new types of partnerships. Partnerships for uh, building innovative business models to roll out these innovations, but also partnerships to change the way of working from being reactive, as I said, to become data-driven and to become proactive. And that um, is also feasible. We've seen it in our work uh, throughout uh, urban health initiatives throughout the world, in Sao Paulo, in Dakar, in um, Vietnam, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and in Ulaanbaatar. We've seen that if we use data to strictly monitor what the health outcomes are from a population, uh, governments have much better ways to influence and allocate their, their resources and their interventions to the right things and become proactive, if you may. So that is really feasible. Other partnerships are absolutely crucial as well to build um, the, the way to bring data together, because data is what will help us get to the next level of transformation in our health system. Data are absolutely crucial to understand what drives these unequal in health outcomes. The rising inequities we saw during the COVID pandemic, it's incredible that we didn't understand that better before the COVID pandemic, but now the, the COVID um, issue has put the spotlight on these inequities and we have to build the partnerships that will enable um, governments, and we do that at the Novartis Foundation specifically with cities, enable governments to understand the underlying drivers of inequities. And we do that not only in low and middle income settings, but we go specifically to data rich cities like New York City or uh, European cities we are discussing with 
to learn how we can uh, build models that can help other cities around the world better understand what drives unequal health outcomes and how to improve population health. So these kind of partnerships and this particular one with the city uh, of New York, for example, we are building now with Microsoft and Accenture, but also with the city government, obviously, and we are discussing also with European cities, is really going to be driving this kind of innovative examinations of existing data to help countries where that data doesn't exist also. So that is the, the beauty of living in this digital era. And lastly, let me say that together with uh, WHO, and I'm, I'm delighted to see you here, Sumia, we are currently uh, co-chairing the next phase of the Broadband Commission Working Group on Health. And this one is specifically looking at how we can leverage what has been um, transformed in an accelerated way during COVID, that countries have uh, deployed virtual health and care services across the, across the globe. And we will specifically look at countries that have been agile and rapid in accelerating the reimbursement, the regulation around virtual health and care, so that other countries can learn from that. And that is a fantastic work we are now doing together with our partners with WHO and many other experts around the world. So I also wanted to highlight that uh, as it's a nice uh, introduction maybe to the next speaker. But thank you again, Christoph. Thank, thank you so much, Anne, and I think you already highlighted many of the topics that will be with us throughout this discussion that um, we are all very excited about the, the possibilities of uh, digital transformation, but it's not only about, you know, shiny new fancy tools. It is very much also about the frameworks that, that we need so that really this can benefit the people, you know, that, that need these innovations for improved healthcare. And I think we will um, come back to that again and again. And um, with that, indeed, I would like to turn to your co-chair in the Broadband Commission, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. And um, Dr. Sumya doesn't need any introduction nowhere, certainly also not at the summit, because, you know, we, we had um, the pleasure to, to, to hear from you, Sumya, uh, you know, several times. And be reassured, you know, nobody gets tired to listen to you. I think the whole world has listened to you over the last one and a half years, because you've often been the voice also of WHO in this COVID pandemic and interpreting um, you know, where we are um, in this pandemic as the chief scientist um, of, of the World Health Organization and a very eminent scientist over many, many years in, in India and globally. Um, and also the, the Department for Digital Health and Innovation and WHO was under the leadership of, of Dr. Sumia. So we are really delighted um, to have you here because everything that we are discussing, you know, starts basically with WHO and with the digital health strategy that, that WHO has developed. This is kind of the, the, the frame and that everybody can contribute to that um, to, to make that work. So please over, over to you, Sumya, for your contribution. Thank you, Christoph. And it's, a, it's indeed a pleasure to be on this panel with uh, very distinguished uh, colleagues who've done so much work in this field. I'll just start with three images that came to my mind just now uh, over the, from the last uh, 18 months, the pandemic months. Um, the first one is, is how clinical trials, we've leveraged digital technologies, um, and I'm sure Martin would also say more to that, but the solidarity trial, the recovery trial, the many platform trials that have done multi-country, multi-centric studies, uh, including all the large vaccine trials that have been done by companies in a time when people could not travel. You, you know, traditionally, you think of going to trial sites and training people there and setting up but trials happened and they happened at you know, high quality trials. So I think the R&D space really needs to look at how do we harness some of these innovations, um, you know, including things like a form that you can fill, the doctor can fill digitally within five to seven minutes because a busy doctor doesn't have more time than that to spend. How do you take informed consent uh, in a few minutes? How do you do pragmatic multi-arm, you know, randomized trials? So that's one image that comes to my mind. The second one is how we leveraged again digital technology to do capacity building, especially for doctors and nurses in parts of the world where uh, they were far away from the big cities, they were far away from intensive care units. And you know, with the Delta wave in 2021, you know that we saw these huge uh, numbers of people getting sick, um, you know, uh, and people were desperate, there were oxygen shortages. 
um, clinics and doctors and nurses who had never used oxygen concentrators before had to use learn how to use them. And while equipments were being shipped around the world, I think the training of people, you know, had not been anticipated. And so we used things like the Project Echo platform to train literally thousands of people with a mentor sitting in the US or Canada or Australia with doctors in Nepal and India and Kenya, you know, learning men and it was an online two way learning process uh, where everybody benefits. Um, and um, the third image that comes to my mind is that when I was last in India, I traveled to a quite a remote tribal area where I found that communities had been cut off for the last 21 months because there is no connectivity there. there even mobile phones don't work and children have to walk about 17 kilometers to get to the nearest mobile uh, coverage point. Therefore, they've missed out on education, on health, and everything that was going on in the world around them. So let's not forget that about half of the world still is not connected through the internet, even though mobile phone coverage is, is better, certainly, and this is something I'm sure the Broadband Commission is, is very interested in. But coming back to uh, the topic of this, uh, this afternoon uh, and health, uh, I think we need to uh, first keep in mind what are we trying to achieve and that is universal health coverage that's what who has stood for from the beginning of uh, and as you know we have the general program of work the gpw 13 which talks about the triple billion goals all the three billions i think are very very uh, relevant today the first one being universal health coverage the second billion being the protection from emergencies and epidemics and the third billion being well-being uh, which is really the social environmental commercial determinants of health and how do we handle those. And I think digital technologies are going to play important role in all of these. So what we would like to do and what we have been doing is working on this. Uh, the member states adopted the global strategy on digital health last year. And this strategy really looks at um, how do we work with member states, WHO, but also the other partners and stakeholders the development banks, the NGOs, the foundations, but also all of the private sector companies out there who are active in this field to ensure that everything we do is leading to better health for people. Uh, and that technologies are used in a way that, that support the attainment of health. And this is where it gets tricky because sometimes one thinks of digital tools as a, as a panacea for everything and it's not. So you need the rigorous research, you need the evidence, you need the cost effectiveness analysis, everything we would do for a drug or a vaccine. And this is why I think groups like IDARE are important because they're putting the research on artificial intelligence uh, out there and, and really focusing particularly on the needs of LMIC countries. So again, taking AI as an example, we, we put together a, a multidisciplinary, a very distinguished panel of experts which also had bioethicists and lawyers, apart from uh, people from the technology side, to look at what does it take for uh, countries to start rolling out AI-based technologies uh, for health, whether it's in diagnostics or whether it's in treatments or whether it's other kinds of services. And we identified, uh, of course, huge potential, but several risks, including the risk of bias, the equity considerations, the fact that once AI comes in between a provider and a patient, then the dynamics is going to change, who takes responsibility, et cetera. And, um, and, and also the, the data solidarity that's been mentioned. Also, how do you generate high quality data? Who owns that data? How is it shared? And how is it used for the best purpose? So this report that was launched about two or three months ago lays out some checklists for developers of AI technologies and algorithms and what they should and shouldn't do, a checklist for ministries of health that are going to adopt those technologies, and also checklists for providers who are going to use them in their health practice. And so what we want to start doing next is building um, what we call a, a, a clearinghouse of digital products, which would enable member states to go to that clearinghouse and say, okay, here is something WHO recommends, and what we would do is try to recommend the technical standards uh, around um, a product and how one would assess that product. And just a quick example is the COVID certificates. As you know, every country is now providing COVID certificates mm. digital to their citizens. It's really important that these are interoperable, that they can be used between countries and that they, they have certain technical standards. So that's 
one of the first examples of technical specifications that is on the clearinghouse, but also things like what we call smart guidelines, which is really moving clinical guidelines and decision support tools into the hands of healthcare providers. But again, it requires certain uh, standards, you know, uh, that countries can follow. Um, so, so those are some of the areas, and we can come back maybe to more mm -hmm. examples. But mm -hmm. it's going to be, I think, joint, it's going to need joint work, partnership, and an iterative process of learning, um, dropping those things which are not effective, and and really moving with those solutions which can bring maximum benefit for the most people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sumi, also for the practical examples, um, your recent experiences, and also the examples how people around the world and member states are already benefiting, of course, from WHO in this field of digital health, and that needs to be expanded now um, uh, jointly, and we'll obviously come back to that in, in the second round. I would now like to turn to Dr. Ricardo Battista Leite, and um, it's a particular pleasure, Ricardo, to, to welcome you uh, to this panel. Um, Ricardo is, um, is an infectious disease physician, but he's also a member of parliament in, in Portugal. And he's well known as the founder and president of the network Unite that brings together parliamentarians from around the world. And some of you might be um, puzzled why Ricardo is on the screen, because you might have seen him here in the halls of the World Health Sum <laughs> Summit until very recently, which is true. But uh, Ricardo had to go back to Lisbon this morning because he has a very important, you know, vote in the parliamentarian in the, in the parliament uh, today. But that's why we are particularly pleased, Ricardo, that you still took the time to find, you know, a computer and a screen and to be with us uh, for the session. So over to you, Ricardo, for, for your contribution. Thank you, Christoph. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with all of you, mm. uh, despite being online. Uh, uh, but it was great to be in person with uh, many of those in the panel. And um, and uh, yes, it is true that we have budget a budget vote tomorrow, which may lead to actually early elections in Portugal. So we're in a bit of a crisis mode right here. But I'll stick, stay focused on the, the debate here on the <laughs> digital health issue. Um, and, you know, following the act of Anne and Dr. Sumia is, it makes my life easier because a lot of the important topics were, were mentioned. And the truth is, uh, you know, Anne mentioned the digital transformation. I, I would actually prefer the wording digital transition because it's inevitable. We're, we either transition or die. And so let's do it right. And that's the only way we're going to be able to foster innovation uh, make it practical for those on the ground, as was said, but also to promote uh, reform. My greatest concern, and looking back at my physician years, um, is seeing moving from analogic to digital, but using the exact same habits of the past. Uh, in other words, uh, just doing uh, in digital format what we used to do in paper without getting the return of that investment in a, in a sense, but also not taking this opportunity to do the reforms towards a more value-based approach to, to medicine and healthcare. And this is particularly relevant, not just in low and middle income countries, but across the globe to make sure that we are capable of leapfrogging and avoiding some of the mistakes that others have made. And this I think needs to be embedded within the, the discussions we have of how do we implement the, the digital uh, transition in, in the healthcare sector? Many of the issues that were mentioned, I, I would like to reinforce. Uh, there is a, an underlying issue when we talk about digital, when we talk about artificial intelligence, which is all of this is really nice and, and interesting, but without data, it's really just a fantasy. Let's be honest. We've been talking about this for years now. And in most settings, AI applied to healthcare is not really a standardized approach in, in most health set systems across the world. And that is due to the lack of proper analytic capacity, data collection capacity within health systems. And so I would say that, you know, many times we have debates around the roof, uh, but we, we, we forget to discuss the foundations that we need, which is the data. And that leads to another discussion, especially in settings like, for example, in the European Union, where uh, under GDPR, uh, opting in is uh, mandatory. People need to express their will to be part of these databases. So the discussion also needs to include then, how do we incentivize that? Do we use blockchain and then monetize 
that data that will create return for whoever is running that data set and creating incentives that we can actually pay back to citizens to be part of that process. These are, I think, very interesting discussions that we can have on a policy level. And that takes me to my part as representative of a network of policymakers and how do we create the framework? And the greatest concern is, and Dr. Sumia said, listen, we need to look at digital as uh, you know, we look at medicines and go through the trials and so forth. The thing is when we assess an AI tool uh, on day one, it's very different than what it's gonna be on day 100 as you start using it, as the algorithm starts learning, especially when you start losing, using deep learning. How do we create legal frameworks that are capable to stay a step ahead? How do we make sure, and you, know, you all know, you follow your parliaments, you know how, how tedious and how slow the policy making can be. How do we make sure that we create uh, loose enough frameworks that make sure that we are fostering innovation at the same time that we are protecting citizens' interests. And the truth is, within my network uh, where at Unite, but also I'm vice president of the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF, we have a few, huge vision of what is happening around the world. Nobody has come up with the perfect solution. And this is something I feel that we need to get policy uh, uh, makers along with the different institutions. And you, Chris, when you uh, at Job Lang Institute, I know you are pushing for these issues and, and with all of the commissions that were mentioned here, I think we need to find that room to work together. One last note uh, to say is on um, an, a different angle of usage of digital when it comes to the lawmaking process. Uh, uh, also at my university, we've been developing what we call a policy calculator applied to healthcare in which using very simple apps, people can see the health outcomes of policies applied to different diseases. And we give the capacity within that app which is user-friendly for anyone to change the policies and see the outcomes. So it really puts at the same level, the policymaker, the advocate and the citizen living with the disease uh, to be able to have a very serious discussion based on science, but in a way everybody understands. And even journalists can understand more adequately what is the impact of doing something, but also the cost opportunity of not doing something. Which, and which goes to show that digital can also be a driver for scientific-based uh, policy making. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and um, great contribution. If you have the opportunity to stay online a little bit, we would appreciate it because I could imagine there will be a follow-up question to you. If you can't and if you are called away for you know, votes or other negotiations, we fully understand, but it would be great if, if you can stay on um, a, a little bit longer. Thank you for that. Um, I would now like to turn to Dr. Nele Leosk. Um, you know, Nele is the ambassador at large of digital affairs and the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Estonia. And I think many people here in the audience and in the world know that Estonia, you know, has been quite a pioneer in, I wouldn't just say digital health, but in digitalization, you know, digitizing also government services and so on. And, and really leading the charge here on, on many different issues. And we are absolutely delighted to have you here as the person, you know, as the ambassador at large, you're overseeing, you know, many of the, these programs in Estonia and in your region, I would say. Um, and so we are very interested to, to hear about uh, your experiences because it's probably, you know, more advanced than in many other countries and there's a lot to learn from that. So over to you, Nele. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for the kind introduction. I, I do hope that most people have, have heard of, of e-Estonia or digital Estonia, that, that indeed has become our dearest um, uh, trademark. And uh, just before uh, preparing for, uh, for, for the panel discussion um, today, I was, I was trying to, to think what, what are these um, main reasons for, for why uh, Estonia has managed really to, to transform into a, a digital society and, and why it has been so. Because not always have we known why we have done certain things and, and not always have we known whether these things will succeed or whether we won't succeed uh, in these things. But, uh, but two of the, I would say, like crucial pillars or components in, in the digitalization of, um, of Estonian society have been our digital identity and our 
uh, I would say, data stewardship or data governance structure. And I am sure many of, um, of you have also um, uh, heard of these. But why these have been successful? Um, in early 2000s, Estonia made a decision to introduce only one digital identity. And, and that digital identity is used across uh, public sector, but also private sector. And the same is with the data. Uh, the data is collected in Estonia once by the uh, public sector, and it is reused and shared with other uh, organizations, but also um, between public and, and private sector. And what this 20 years of experience has done, it has really uh, sought us first to, to share our practices, uh, to, to share our data with each other. Um, and this sharing and reusing culture um, has been very important, let's say, in, in Estonia's digital, digital philosophy, that, that we are small, we are not so wealthy, we cannot uh, spend developing every time a new uh, system, a new tool, when it is already there. And we see it quite a bit also with AI solutions now. So it has been a long process. But the other is related to uh, how the end user, the person sees digital. It, it, for the end user, there is one virtual world. There is no, not a digital health room or digital, digital education room or, or digital finance. For them, there is one digital world and this um, experience is created in a combination of different areas. So introducing one ID and, and by introducing the data sharing concept, the level of digitalization has been, I would say, not entirely equal, but rather equal across those uh, organizations and, and towns uh, that are perhaps big and wealthy and have a great capacity and across those that are actually small because they did not have to invest in these things um, uh, themselves. But in a, in a bigger picture, it is actually related to how you build trust towards digitalization. And, and, and here in, in these two days, we have also talked quite a bit of, of the risks that may actually become barriers for, for digital innovation, which was also pointed out mm -hmm. by, by panelists here. And this is exactly that. We cannot create trust in just in digital health okay. or just in digital education. It's a combination of the experiences that people have with e-participation tools, with um, uh, mobile uh, applications in, in traffic, uh, how they pay taxes, and, and it makes a, a one big uh, a room. But it, but it, of course, nowadays is increasingly also posing challenges to us because um, people may not necessarily also separate public and private sector digitalization um, a sort of room and, and these start playing with each other as well but uh, i would like to come here with my last point and and this has um, got to do with how these two essential components have been developed and managed and how they are still managed uh, until the uh, the present day it is a partnership with, between private and public sector, but not the partnership where the private sector would uh, give the expertise or their services would be uh, sort of uh, outsourced. It is really a responsibility that public and private sector together took to develop and maintain these essential components of digitalization. And this is a very crucial aspect also uh, and I would say even more crucial nowadays, it is clear that it's not governments often who have the digital power, uh, no matter what sector. It is often the private sector that also, also has to share that responsibility with everybody, all the players in, um, in, uh, in our society. So I would perhaps end, uh, end here and, uh, and uh, ask us all to contribute. Yeah. Uh, to this uh, difficult process. Thank you so much. No, that was a very great contribution, Elena. I know that you know 
there were already explorations of a close partnership between Estonia and IDAIR and, and to see how the world can benefit from your experiences in Estonia, but maybe also how you can benefit from you know, experiences in other countries and how we can bring this together to build the kind of greater good. Um, so that's that's part of what we are trying to, to build here. But thanks also for mentioning um, the question of trust. You know, uh, I've heard that here also during the conference, and I think we're all aware that when it comes to data sharing, data governance, data solidarity, the issue of trust is absolutely crucial, because why would anybody share data if there is no trust in how this is being used? And I think we can, we can jointly mm -hmm. learn a lot, you know, um, uh, from that. Um, now it is not only my, my pleasure, but I would say indeed an honor to introduce the next panelist, which is Professor Dr. Awa Kolsek. Um, Awa is in fact the Minister of State in Senegal, but that doesn't do justice to Awa's long career as a real global leader in, in, in global health for many, many years. Um, so, you know, I can't, uh, you know, list all your, your functions, Awa, but I remember particularly well your many years as Executive Director of Rollback Malaria. Um, when we had the pleasure to work together quite closely when I was at the Global Fund and you were leading Rollback uh, Malaria. I think we've shared many panels and board meetings together. Then you went back to your home country, you were the Minister of Health, and now you are the Minister of State. I think there is no better person to kind of share with us, you know, what, what we are discussing here, how that, what that should mean for a country like Senegal. As Sumia mentioned, you know, it's all about UHC and how we get closer to UHC. But if we think, you know, what can, you know, the, the digital transformation or transition, as Ricardo said, contribute, you know, we, we need to look at countries like yours and with your experience, how do you, where do you see um, Senegal is right now and, and how can Senegal use the opportunities while kind of um, uh, being aware also of, of the challenges to, to really help that this is kind of driving uh, towards UHC. Very much looking forward to your contribution now. Thank you, uh, Christoph. I, it's my pleasure also to be here and to meet with you because we have not seen each other for a long time. And also because uh, we have a lot of topics important for countries and this is one of the topics I like a lot and I am here also to learn because uh, we think in Senegal that digital uh, way to work in this country will help us to go far further and quicker because this can be an, a tool for development. And some uh, words I would like really to highlight now <coughs> before speaking of Senegal is the issue of uh, solidarity, the issue of equity, because we need to not only develop this for those who have means, but for also the poorest people. We have also, uh, for me, well, something we have said all the days I have been here, it's we need to act now because it's always good to have meetings where we discuss, where we exchange, but at the end of the day, going back home, things are not moving. And I think that this is also a point I would like to share with you. Going back now to Senegal, the experience we have is not used, but we try. And Recently, we have done a mapping and more than 55 uh, initiatives on digital health or uh, artificial intelligence has been highlighted. And this is just examples because the issue is to ensure that these are useful for the health system are useful to improve access to care, are useful for the population. And just some example, telemedicine, for example, 
uh, has been used for a long time, more by universities, etc. But it's not developed. And with COVID, we have seen a sort of new engagement, uh, commitment on that because uh, the, the, the transport was difficult. The, some region was a little bit close. You have uh, difficulties to travel inside the Senegal. And uh, a lot of uh, people in the field was asking for that. And uh, particularly uh, universities has, involved, has been involved and we have been uh, very uh, happy to see that professor from Dakar or from another university was able to do this telemedicine with the rural area, etc. But this is something we know, but I will explain it at the end, we have a problem. The e-learning also, we went through a lot of initiatives, but I would like here to just uh, remind people who know a little bit what has been done. Uh, the continuing education, and this is what uh, my friend I am seeing often now in panels from WHO, you, you have explained it. Uh, the e-learning is very important also because you can use it for a lot of things and uh, it can be as for for example to train uh, aids hiv aids professional to update them regularly we have done it for ebola we have done it also for covid and this has helped us to reach a number we need we will not reach if it was just normal way to to work we have also the 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 another, another example is for graduation when we had to do a reform and had to change the civil servant from one step to another, with AMREF, from the, the NGO you know, we have been able to do that for the nurses and for also other type uh, technician uh, to be able to go from one step as civil servant to another. So this is also something we can share share with you, and we have a lot. Mm. But uh, another I want to 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 present is uh, the robot with uh, COVID, and to avoid uh, health personnel workers to be always in contact with people, with patients, and uh, it was possible to use it to uh, give medication to give. Uh, meals uh, to take temperature, etc. And this has been also an experience we have. But I would like to say that we are not like Estonia or for Africa. Rwanda is my country I like to take <laughs> as example because they have done like you. They have put it as a global strategy for the country, not only for health, but for other sectors. And I think that this needs to be, this is why with my position as Minister of State to the President. Uh, this is something I want to, 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 I know that we have a Minister of mm -hmm. New Technology, etc., but it is not going at the same uh, level everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have as opportunity, we have now a department at the Minister of Health in charge of digital health. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a program, we have a plan of uh, a strategic plan, an action plan. We have clearly priorities for the country. Um, we have also human resources. Mm -hmm. This is something often in the developing world we say you have no human resources. We have. We have engineers, we have a lot of other people. And in Senegal and outside of Senegal, some are ready to come back to Senegal if they have place to do this work. Uh, we have also a data center mm -hmm. and, and so on. And the problem I want to highlight is that we are fragmented. We are just doing a lot of initiatives, but nothing is really coordinated. And it's where we, we will need, of course, with the with the strategic plan, this is one of the mm -hmm. issues we have 
to, to tackle. But I think that this is an emergency because we cannot continue with project here, project there. We need to have a real program and go to scale mm -hmm. because okay. we are not going to scale. These are the main issues I have to share with you. But uh, if we come back again to the discussion, maybe I will give more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to that. Thank you so much. Um, Oh, and I think um, your last point is, is absolutely critical, you know, it, and I think we are here in a sense so that, you know, when, when you're building your, your national strategies, how can you then scale that up and implement that countrywide in an equitable way? And I hope um, th this panel is not only a nice discussion, but it's also the opportunity to build new partnerships, mm -hmm. you know, to, to work with you in Senegal and, and many other countries um, to, to promote that. So thank you very much for, for that contribution. Now, last but certainly not least, for this kind of first round of you know, comments is Dr. Martin Fitchett, the head of global health um, of Johnson & Johnson, you know, a company that, that also is, is very, very well known, not only one of the largest companies in the sector, but you know, for its, known for its innovation in many different ways, and on pharmaceutical products, of course, but also on, on many other topics, including you know, digital health. And um, I know you have a background also as a surgeon, you've served you know, in the industry with different companies, but, but you are now the, the head of you know, global public health for, for j and &J. Um, you have already de developed a number of really exciting tools that I believe, but you're also aware you know, what it takes to apply those tools you know, in, in settings like in Senegal and elsewhere so that it, it is really integrated in, into those systems. So Martin, we are Thank delighted you. to have you here. I know you have some slides and we'll speak from, from the podium. Uh, thank you so much, Christoph, uh, esteemed fellow panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. I promise you it's just a handful of slides. I didn't know I was the only one with slides, so I apologize, but I, I will not override my time. <laughs> but I think it will help illustrate the example I'd like to make today. So, so firstly, I think, really incredibly important points have been made about the digital divide 3.7 billion people about access to internet worldwide the capabilities that we need the importance of building digital capabilities but i wanted to just take you on a quick journey through my organization global public health and a particular example that we have by using existing tools and capabilities to build what we felt was a, an extremely useful digital circuit that amplified impact uh, in in our ebola program so let me see if a clicker works. So uh, very, very quick. So who are we? Global Public Health. I think uh, those of you who don't know who we are in Johnson Johnson, we're a unique organization in the fact that we are an end-to-end -end organization within j, &J. Uh, We have an R&D team that uh, deliberately innovates against step change, world-class innovations, mainly medicines, pharmaceutical medicines, but also surgical technologies to innovate against for major uh, challenges in underserved communities and major disease burdens. Um, we have about 170 people, but I'm proud to say that we treat impact by the end of year around 250 million people this year. So that's around 1.4 million people per associate. And we're looking to accelerate that to over a billion people by the middle of a decade. Um, again, we, we really leverage uh, our innovation and our innovation is the core of what we do. And then we hope to build partnerships around the innovation. Part of the point of me saying this is as we develop our, I would say, our nascent digital capabilities as predominantly a healthcare company, we are looking to partner very much with those, uh, particularly locally and regionally in Africa in particular, around our programs so we can deliver a fully integrated solution. So any ideas, anybody, please call me or, or come and see me after the meeting. But, but let me give you an idea of where we are right now. This is our ambition. We call this our rather unimaginatively our global public health 2030 strategy uh really, really why i said this is because we're aiming to really innovate where we can innovate best and so we can't do everything we don't have the scientific depth and expertise in everything but we have it in some important areas multi-drug resistance tv mental health where we have not only in but a, but a whole suite of respiratory chain and novel uh, uh drugs uh, are currently in our pipeline uh, we have our, our SARS-CoV-2 vaccine uh, from Janssen. We are accountable in public health for the safe stewardship of that vaccination program with our partners in Africa. We have HIV, including our two-month-long acting injectable, which we've just filed in Botswana and Africa. And last but not least, and this is why I'm hitting it at last, is Ebola. And I'm going to talk about how we used uh, 
uh, existing capabilities and technologies to bring, I believe, a very valuable digital circuit to increase impact in our Ebola vaccination program. And just moving over to the right hand side of that slide, we're also deliberately uh, developing unique um, uh, capabilities. And one of them is integrated technology interventions, basically building up our digital capabilities, our ability to speak the digital language, and most importantly, to identify the strongest partners, particularly locally and regionally, to help complement um, our therapeutically focused programs. So our aim really is to build digital platforms around each of those therapeutic areas uh, of need that I spoke to just now, uh, ones that are interoperable, preferably that they are uh, therapeutically agnostic and they're open source and they are locally sustainable and they're implementably locally and the data feedback loop which comes locally will enable us to improve the technology's quality and patient impact on a local basis. So let me talk about the example. Uh, I'm here in a digital panel after all. Uh, what is the example I'd like to bring to you? So let me just tell you a little bit about Ebola. I think no stranger to this audience. Increasing frequency of outbreaks, uh, even in the period of, of COVID. Uh, we have our, our first vaccine actually in Johnson & Johnson before uh, our SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was approved was actually our Ebola vaccine uh, last year and with World Health Organization pre-qualification. It's actually a, a, a heterologous booster uh, uh, vaccine with an AD26 prime and an MVA boost. So two vaccinations, two administrations, 56 days apart. And what happened is the government of Rwanda came to us and it was at the time uh, as, uh, of a North, the North Kivu outbreak uh, around two to three years ago. I said, can you help us vaccinate the, our Rwandan, Rwandan population at the border of the Congo, around the, uh, on the border of, of Goma? but in Rwanda, and we'd like to do this as quickly as possible. And we thought, well, this is quite, it's gonna be quite complicated. We, we're gonna to have to build the vaccination centers, but how do we track these patients? How do we drive them back 56 days later for their second dose? And how do we have a feedback loop of data to help, help improve our efficacy and our adherence? What we developed, and this was developed with EBODAC IMI and the J&J team, we developed a vaccine monitoring platform. And it's actually rather simple, but extremely effective. So the question, if you think about the need, how do we identify patients? That identification is gonna to have to hold for the second vaccination. It has to be the right patient. We also have to address privacy concerns. The population that we were dealing with wanted to be sure that their data would be used responsibly and anonymously. And so we brought in biometric iris scanning, extremely accurate, maintains privacy and anonymity, um, and it's extremely reliable, sensitive and specific and can be used, can be actually administered with an iPad or an iPhone. And then we had a central database that these data came into and that enabled us to issue reports, uh, progress reports and uh, updates to all the sites around the, the, the neighborhood and the region of Rwanda. And then this was really important because as we know, many of our patients didn't have access to the internet, but they did have cellular, te cellular technology. And so the, the, the platform also sent out automated texts in the language of the patients, and there were multiple languages we use, reminding them of when they had to come back for their second vaccination, any safety updates that were necessary, or any study-related updates. Now, it seems quite simple, but this was remarkably, this was done remarkably quickly with fantastic cooperation for, for, from the Rwandan Ministry of Health and our local investigators, and of course, amazing cooperation from the people uh, of Rwanda. And we saw this, and this is remarkable. We vaccinated 214,000 people. Before COVID, we had a 99% return adherence to the second vaccination, 99% for the second vaccination with full matching and identification of, of, of those subjects. And because of COVID that went down to 91%, but an overall adherence and a vaccination program done rapidly over 12, 12 month period 214,000 people of a 94% uh, fully uh, dosed compliance, which I think is something that hasn't been seen before. And again, it was a digital platform using existing technology where we, we couldn't obviously use the internet per se, but we were delighted with this and we hope that this can be used now moving forward in many other programs. Now we feel this is a proof of concept. We feel particularly with many of the COVID vaccines 
Again, it's, it's platform, but open source platform, it can be used by anybody. It's agnostic to the disease platform, it can be used for COVID vaccination too, and other vaccination programs. And so just to summarize, we are building our capabilities in digital to surround our innovation-driven end-to-end global public health platforms uh, and therapeutic uh, advances. We'd like to partner and we'd like to do it in an open source way. We'd like to do it with data interoperability. We'd like to do it where it's locally sustainable. So that's my talk. I, I hope I kept the time and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, um, Martin. You, you, you did, and you presented really very interesting examples. And again, I would hope that this session is not only a kind of, you know, academic conversation, but also the opportunity for building partnerships, because I think some of what you presented, you know, is very relevant, you know, in, in many different contexts and, and, and countries and can benefit from there. We know there's hardly a more important issue these days than, you know, equitable access to vaccines. You know, you have the Ebola vaccine, you have also have a COVID vaccine, of course, but how to monitor, how to know exactly in who's getting it, who's not, and, and you know, how can we fill the gaps? I think you, you have important um, innovations there, you know, in, in that respect. Thank you for, for that. So maybe some <clears throat> guidance for, for the last um, good half hour that, that we have. Um, there's the opportunity for, for the audience to, to ask questions. There are microphones for the rooms, but I also wanted to give the opportunity for the panel. If, if you have a question to another panelist, because there was something that, that, that you found really interesting or you want to follow up on, um, just indicate to me and, and you know that, that you, there would be a little bit of time you know, uh, for, for you here. I know there is also the opportunity for you if you use the QR code of the session, you can uh, type your questions and they will come to this um, uh, tablet here and, and I will then try to kind of you know, integrate uh, your questions in, into the uh, final discussion. So, um, you know, get, get ready for that um, so that we have now a little bit of, of a discussion here. I would like to start actually with our um, two panelists, you know, that are, you know, on the online, on the screen. Um, uh, and I have a question to, to both of you and I'm glad to see Ricardo, um, you're still there. Um, <laughs> so uh, maybe first to you, Anne. Um, you know, you talked about your role in the Broadband Commission. I know you also have a kind of AI maturity assessment tool and, and so on. And I actually th wondered, you know, when, when I listened to, to our, you know, we, we are talking about countries at many different levels of digital maturity. Um, and, and you mentioned Rwanda as a particular example in, in, in Africa, you know, very advanced. I mean, Estonia is advanced here in Europe and, and globally. But, you know, from from your experience and what we're you're trying to achieve, you know, through the Commission, um, what what can be done to help a country like Senegal to move up in the kind of digital maturity rating, which means then, you know, you, you can use all these opportunities in, in a more productive way. What, what is your suggestion there? Thank you, Christoph. It's not an easy answer, no. but I and, and I have forgotten to say that by now we have to be pretty brief with our answers. I'm very sorry. And so this makes your task even more yeah. impossible. I know, Anne, but but you will manage. No, but it's a really, really important question. And I think uh, Awa has answered it herself. Eh? It requires really the um, a visionary leadership that takes it as an all of the government approach. And I think that is absolutely key that there is a lot of intersectoral collaboration so that the different ministers of different departments do work together towards a digital society because it's true, it's a transition. I like that very much what you said, Ricardo. It's not just a transformation. We have to, on the one hand, try to make our lives easier for all of the health workers in the health sector. But on the other hand, we have to rethink processes rethink the way we do deliver health and care and therefore you need an overall uh, view and and definitely it's the role of the national government to set that framework for interoperability for data privacy security for the governance everything that is definitely the government's role but um, having that visionary leadership you expressed our is the first and foremost factor for success now, I do believe that many of the countries where we have uh, initiatives in would benefit a lot from the upskilling of the people, the workforce, and uh, the government leaders in the field of digital and data science. And I know Senegal it may be an exception, Awa, because you have extremely well-educated uh, staffs and professionals everywhere. Um, but unfortunately, that's not everywhere the case. And I, I think that's a major 
um, domain to invest in for every government. And definitely partnering with uh, different sector, private sector, different disciplines mm -hmm. is also key to success. I think in the field of digital, it has to be a partnership between mm. the health sector and the tech sector. The health sector can never build that capacity the tech sector has, but the tech sector doesn't understand the priorities that need to be addressed and always wants to come with the solution where it has to be the, the decision makers in country giving the priority needs they want to address with their with a digital solution. And in that sense, it will be possible to scale solutions if you do that. Great. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, very clear. And thank you for being brief. <laughs> Ricardo, I also have one question to you. Um, you know, we're talking about a very important topic, but also a very complex one. We, we just need to look at the kind of Lancet FT report that, that we mentioned. You know, it, it is a very complex issue. And we also know, and you've mentioned that, that, you know, policymakers, parliamentarians around the world, and basically every country around the world, have a very important role to play. Uh, you know, because you will be providing the kind of legal frameworks for, for where, you know, digital transformation operates. Um, how can also your network of parliamentarians unite, support parliamentarians maybe to kind of navigate this very complex um, process, you know, if, if they have to initiate national legislation and so on, so that also following the Lancet FT report, you know, we are, we are building the, the, these frameworks globally. Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. we can hear, yeah. I, I, was, I was saying you only ask easy questions today. So thank yes. you for that. <laughs> but, but, but to say that, uh, uh, you know, we meant uh, so many important topics were mentioned here. And one of them was trust building, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, across the board in everything we do. And the truth is, if we are not capable to find the, the legal frameworks that are allow, uh, can allow them innovation to prosper and for these these reforms and the re-engineering that Anne's talked about at the beginning of health systems and so forth to happen, well, we will be blocking that, that evolution in a way. And that will be undermining our efforts of taking out the maximum capacity out of the digital potential that is out there. And so where I feel that UNITE as a global network of parliamentarians, as I mentioned, we've joined forces with the uh, the parliamentary network of the World Bank and IMF to create the, inter the International Forum on Global Health, which is a federation of networks. Uh, we are already 14 different parliamentary networks. So thousands of parliamentarians, members of Congress, the Senate's parliaments from around the world. We, we hear from our colleagues on the ground, the elected representatives saying, we need guidance. We need uh, standardized uh, approaches and templates in terms of legal frameworks that we can push for in our own parliaments, because there is a, 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 a growing conscience of need, uh, speaking with the players on the ground and understanding that this needs to be um, a partnership approach, as you've said so many times, and involving not only the state, but also the private sector and working together and finding those solutions, making sure on the trust side, who is really owning the data and making sure that it is kept safe and that it is only used in aggregate for, for the clinical studies and for all of the work that can come out of it. So really, uh, all of this discussion is still very early on. And I feel that uh, at, at UNITE, we're now creating a policy desk on digital health precisely to start to look at some of the good examples that are out there and try to build from that to try to standardize how on the legislative side, the legal side, we can create the, the laws and regulations that can serve as an example for countries around the world. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I think that will be very important because the, you need a, the parliamentarians need this source of information that is trusted and, and, and that we also need to build together in this partnership approach. Um, I have one question from, from the audience um, that I would like to address to you, Sumia. Um, the, the question is, how can we get governments in the world to cooperate and to learn from more digital experience gained, um, like the kind of vaccine monitoring platform that, that we've heard about from Martin to manage COVID-19 vaccinations? And I know you know you are across the field in, in WHO, not only on, on, on digital, but also on you know vaccine rollout and, and so on. So maybe you can address that. But I wanted to combine that with 
a question from from um, myself. I mean, we've emphasized again and again, you know, the the critical role of WHO for everything we are discussing here. You know, the many different um, great initiatives and 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 so on. Um, but it builds on on you know the 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 agency that is responsible for for the normative guidance in in in, in global health. Um, and I recall, you know, we had a great opening ceremony here with with Dr. Tedros and. Um, he, he also emphasized very clearly, you know, uh, WHO needs to have the support to, to do their work um, for WHO in general. And he mentioned, you know, the absolute need to kind of increase the contributions from the member states and, and others, you know, to, to WHO. So my question would also be to you, um, you know, what else can, can member states and others do to support WHO, not only in its general mission, but there is also the kind of mission to kind of you know, apply the digital health strategy that you have to maximize the benefits for, for countries. So I wanted to kind of raise that as well. If you want to comment on that, you know, you know, how can WHO be supported to do its job so that WHO can support all the member states in, in, in you know, achieving what, what we are trying to achieve here together. And if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the, the role of coordination and cooperation between governments, because that is really also a role for, for, for WHO. Yes, thank you, Christoph. I think that's a really interesting um, comment and question, but thank you also for pointing out that WHO is expected to do a huge amount um, with relatively very little resources, and we are constantly being asked to do more and more and respond in a timely um, fashion um, to, to crises, which, uh, which obviously needs resources. So the, I think the science division uh, definitely has... Uh, this um, goal of leveraging the advances in science and technology that are coming down. I mean, this is why Dr. Tedros created the science division. He says, we have to be ahead of the curve. We cannot be in responsive mode all the time, catching up. And so we need, so we've set up a foresight function, you know, that looks at what's coming down the pipeline 10, 15, 20 years from now. What do we need to do in terms of framing policies and guidance to countries, because as you, as you said, a large number of uh, countries still very much rely on WHO for, for guidance and for setting the standards, really, and for the principles that they could then use. So whether it's digital standards, uh, we believe in open source software, obviously, but then, you know, within certain technical specifications, um, standards around data sharing, uh, especially looking at the ethics and the equity aspects uh, uh, of data sharing but also looking at some of the potential risks. And we've seen the, the infodemic and the anti-science uh, movements and how they can really um, create a huge amount of societal confusion and upheaval, uh, especially in the face of a, of a pandemic and create doubts in the minds of people. So I think companies, you mentioned also that private, especially the big technology companies and the giants have a, a huge responsibility here because they influence people uh, constantly all the time and uh, they also have access to a lot of data about individuals and and what they do with that data how they use that data you know uh, on the one hand you could monetize the data and, and use it for profit but you could also use it for public good and particularly i'm referring to health data that they collect from people you know they collect data on physical activity on on mental health, et cetera. I think those we need to leverage. And I think WHO is very open to working with these companies. We have worked with them in the sense of how to address misinformation and, 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 and how to direct, how their algorithms could direct people to credible sources of information rather than you know, misinformation sites and flagging and removing. I think there's work to be done in that area because more and more we heard from you know, the Lancet Financial Times Commission, the youth, a survey that was done that most youth depend on mm. information from the internet for their own health and rather than asking someone asking an adult they would like to get it from their um, their um, machines and their their phones or their peers and so it's really important the kind of information that's out there so again also goes back to the responsibility that companies have uh, Ava has been talking about the commercial interests and, and the commercial drivers of health and uh, this is a social responsibility that, that everybody has. I think it's good for companies <clears throat> and governments to do the right thing for health, because mm -hmm. without good health, 
as we've seen, you lose everything else. Mm. So we would be very happy to work with, I think it's a, it's a process of building step by step, but um, most countries now recognize that it's really important to have a comprehensive, uh, mm. as Ricardo just said, um, all of government approach to building this, uh, first the digital infrastructure, but then also what services you provide and how you monitor, how you learn and uh, impact evaluation, I think mm -hmm. is also very important. Mm -hmm. I think we, we have to constantly learn because again, the AI algorithm was mentioned as an example. Mm -hmm. How do you assess a diagnostic technology that's based on AI? Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that we are working on uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sumia. I think some of what you said, uh, Martin, might be also a question to you a little bit later on, on, you know, the partnership between private sector and, and, and WHO, just to, to flag that. But before coming back to, to the three of you, I wanted to ask one question um, to you, Amandeep, um, and I would ask that the colleagues provide a room microphone to, to Amandeep Gill, the CEO of, of IDER, also a member of the Lancet FT Commission, um, so you've been very much part of, of developing this very, very important report. You know what is required, if, if you like, to build, you know, uh, the foundation and the framework to implement what we are discussing here. And you've listened to many of the um, excellent comments. Um, in, in your view, what, what can I dare do kind of, to kind of contribute, to kind of put this really into practice? I mean, we, we need the research component as well, but there are concrete ideas how this, this can promote, you know, the digital transformation that we are talking about here. Thank you very much, Christoph, and great points by all the panelists. My mind went to Somia, your use of those three images, and the image that came to my mind was Windsurf's uh, first sketch of the internet, those four nodes across uh, uh, these universities. Uh, so really the theory of change uh, uh, for our work in IDEA is that if you can target the R&D community and if you can enable their work, uh, then magic happens. So if you today have trillion dollar economies in different sectors built on top of the internet and it started as open source uh, and open protocols, uh, uh, interoperability uh, was a strong component of it. So I think our focus is very much on enabling that transdisciplinary community of researchers particularly leveraging the talent that's emerging in the global south. You know, we've seen that with the pandemic, uh, the genomics uh, talent that has sprung up in Western Africa, for example, the modeling talent in Asia. So these are people who are hungry to not only solve their own problems, but also participate in addressing global challenges. So how do we make that happen through a platform, which also this problem that Nelly mentioned of trust, because today mm. digital is sensitive. So by collaborating together on those global challenges, you hardwire habits of working together, of collaboration, and prevent a kind of a, a race to the bottom with nationalist uh, or uh, parochial approaches uh, to uh, digital uh, issues. So I think that would be my uh, quick answer. But mm -hmm. hopefully, in uh, next edition of the World Health Summit, we can bring some mm -hmm. concrete examples. Martin shared a very nice concrete examples from situational mapping of the R&D landscape, who's doing what, what needs to be done, encourage capacity building, distributed research infrastructures uh, to allow uh, the local community of data science uh, developers, users uh, to uh, not to be uh, uh, hampered by the lack of high performance computing or generic AI models to start the paper to digital and the digital to AI uh, mm -hmm. transformations. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amandeep. And indeed, um, we'll come back to that in the end because we see this as a kind of, you know, process. You know, uh, this is not just one session. And if you like, we want to monitor that and then we want to promote this over time uh, to get to our common goal. Um, and uh, turning to you again, Nele, I mean, I think we've all been fascinated by, by the example of, of, of Estonia and um, we, we are aware that there's so much to learn. Um, what's your kind of plan, if I may say, or ambition, you know, to, to collaborate with many other countries, organizations, maybe including those, you know, here on the panel or in the room, so that, you know, um, uh, 
the, the whole world can benefit from from your experience, but we also achieve this kind of exchange of, of ideas and building the, 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 the systems. Um, you already have plans for that in Estonia? Yes, thank you. So, so now we are going into more my area of, yes. <laughs> of work and expertise as I as uh, this is my task actually to, to coordinate digital uh, diplomacy and, and also to establish these partnerships. Mm -hmm. And I would have to come back actually to you because uh, the bigger part of the of these partnerships does not concern sharing our uh, experience. It, it actually concerns also how to get this new technological knowledge and, and skills into our country and, and how to benefit also ourselves from everything that is happening because the market is very crowded. And, and as we know, these technological trends uh, do not uh, take place in small countries. So they have never taken place in Estonia. We have never been an innovator, innovators mm -hmm. of technology, but we have always been very smart adopters of these, uh, uh, these technological innovations, but it's increasingly more difficult to mm. get people with right skills and knowledge and, and mm. also much bigger countries are struggling with, with it and not to then, then mention Estonia. So, mm. so Estonia is very much looking forward to different partnerships with international organizations, uh, private sector, mm. Uh, to see how to collaborate and 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 bring this new knowledge um, across the different sectors. Uh, okay. and so there is countries. a capacity problem and a kind of problem to mm -hmm. attract enough people who can you know work on that and and, and promote that. Uh, yes, we are currently also in this um, process also of establishing how to really um, manage these um, uh, partnerships uh, yep. um, also internally, because this is not really a task of any public administration, because they have their own, uh, mm -hmm. uh, own uh, uh, sort of everyday obligations and, and aims, and this is more to, to assist Estonia mm -hmm. and, uh, and not to have this uh, external sort of a focus. But that is one other reason actually uh, for cooperation. And, and this is a little bit re related also the, the trust as technologies do not uh, recognize borders. Uh, this is no longer an issue we can uh, handle alone. And we have talked quite a bit of, of how to, uh, how to uh, let's say, I would decrease these risks or, or worries that people have over their privacy, data, and, and, uh, and security, and so forth. And from Estonia's experience, we can see that it is not only by regulating. You have to really cope and deal with these fears, because these fears won't disappear. We saw it also in Europe. We have GDPR in place. Mm -hmm. uh, in Estonia, we have the security frameworks, privacy frameworks, data governance frameworks, everything is in place and is working it doesn't mean that people do not have any fears. They still have these fears. Technology is moving target and, and these fears have to be dealt with. And, uh, and an example we have from 2000, for example, when we started with digitalization, people were really afraid. Okay, what will happen now with my data before it was all in paper, now it's going to be digital. So yes, we introduced our legal framework but at the same time we gave every citizen an opportunity to access their own data and be the managers of their own data so and and also give the right to see how their data has been used so this has now done for the uh, public sector maybe this can also be done for the the data that the private sector holds of mm. of people so that also talks uh, about this so so, um, and this cannot also be done by just one country, but by, mm. by, by partnerships with uh, like, private sector and others. I mean, what you're saying, I mean, really calls mm -hmm. for a kind of global networking. Yes. Because only that mm -hmm. will bring kind of all these capacities together and together we will be then much, much stronger, if you like. Uh, so that's great. Um, <clears throat> turning to you, Martin, and I, you know, already indicated, you know, I would be happy if you wanted to, to respond also to what Sumia said, because I mean, you're a company, you know, that is engaged in innovation in many different ways, and you, and you showed examples. You need the WHO as well, because you know they have to prove, you know, what what you develop, so that it can be applied globally. So, 
you know, you need um, that uh, collaboration. But maybe also what what Nella just said, you know, because you indicated the, the need to kind of partner with the, with the private sector, and, and you know, what's the opportunity there from um, from your perspective at, at J and J? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So, so firstly, uh, Samir, I, I think the WHO were, were, were superb partners during COVID, particularly in terms of a rapid review, the rolling review of the dossiers for the vaccines. I, I think we got emergency use listing within 24 hours of of a European approval. So what we saw as a company developing essentially a vaccine, a pharmaceutical aid like agent, was just a sea change in the responsiveness, not just of WHO, but of regulators, almost like a harmonization of processes around the world that I think we've been looking for across many diseases for many years, but it happened. Uh, data were reviewed on a rolling basis. To Samir's point, we also managed to utilize uh, digital platforms in a way that we have never done before. So we didn't have time to ask permission. I think uh, we used uh, a very powerful um, uh, data sources and AI algorithms to understand where the outcomes and the COVID were spreading and which uh, variants. So we could place our clinical trial sites in their path. You, uh, and that would allow us to get the data a lot quicker because the more actual, the more events of COVID we have, the faster we can demonstrate uh, the efficacy of, of the vaccine. Those were really positive developments. And we also have seen the use, I think, with, within our South Africa our Sasanke study, where we vaccinated, I think, 477,000 healthcare workers, the ability to use in silico controls. So in a, in a COVID situation, you can't have a placebo, right? Mm. So you have to be able to rely on silico controls and, and matching our controls. And we're developing that expertise very, very quickly as well. And I have a feeling that's going to become more acceptable than it has done historically. Uh, plus the, the demand for much faster real-time data. Um, and I'd like to see us being able to do that as we roll out our vaccine um, in Africa, our ability to also generate the kind of rapid real-time real-world data that we've been able to do in the United States, for example, we need to be able to do in Africa where the databases and, 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 and the, uh, the capabilities allow it. And I think there are countries where we can do that and we do need to get those data quickly. Uh, so those are all real changes that have happened real time in the last 18 months, but I think have been a remarkable improvement on the urgency, but also the cooperation between normative bodies as well as regulators. Um, and I hope we can continue that. In terms of, of cooperation with private sector, I, I'm not sure, Nelly, whether, whether you're referring more to tech companies rather than, than healthcare companies. I'm not sure. Um, but um, we're certainly open to you, partnering. You, you kind of indicated you're both, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we, no, I, I'm not sure we're a tech company. We're still a healthcare company, but we're trying to develop capabilities where we can speak the language of right. data sciences. We have we have a, a remarkably accelerated expert data sciences group, particularly in our pharmaceutical sector. They supply us of expertise. We're building data sciences capabilities in public health. It enables us to understand what's needed, to speak the language, and to partner effectively. And we've, and, and we've always felt that we should focus on what we do best, but we should understand the language of what we need so we can partner with people who are even better at that. And I think in many aspects, in digital solutions, we're very open to partnering still because what we do best is we innovate the healthcare product. Uh, we, we generate the access, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, and we, we're building our capabilities so we can identify the strongest partners. And our public health model doesn't work without partnership mm. uh, because we can't do everything. We shouldn't do everything. We don't have the expertise to do everything. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Our the last question goes to you. Um, you know, we've heard many different, you know, aspects, hopefully also helpful suggestions, what can be done, you know, ideas, you know, that, that can be implemented, always keeping in mind what, what you mentioned before, you know, our aim is to kind of scale up, you know, national plans um, to accelerate, you know, progress towards UHC. Um, you know, after hearing all these contributions, um, what, what's your conclusion, if you like? And I would ask you in this case uh, in two different ways. I know you are the Minister of State of Se Senegal and have been the Minister of Health, but you also have a global perspective. You've been working globally, and in a sense, you're representing many other ministers who can't be here today. Um, so it has two parts, if you like. You know, 
Um, what do you take away from, from this discussion and where could there be also really valuable partnerships, you know, that, that you know, could benefit Senegal from, from what we discussed here, from the different sectors? And if you, if you like, you know, you, you could also take the perspective of, you know, looking more broadly at, at your region, you know, and, and you, you, you know very well the situation across Africa and beyond. Um, so, because, you know, the, the goal is to kind of use this for, for access for health for, for, for all. Uh, I, I would like, first of all, to react mm -hmm. sure. to uh, the, the, the point raised during the discussion, which is the issue of confidentiality, the issue of trust, and uh, what we have as experience when we were uh, do, uh, vaccinating people from COVID, because we had a platform for people to be registered. Uh, some were saying, why they are asking all these questions? Because uh, they want to be vaccinated. Why they are asking if I have a comorbidity, what they will do with these figures. Some say I put just one because uh, I don't want them to know everything I have because I don't know what they will do with this uh, data. And uh, I just uh, maybe after we can discuss it, but it will be good to share also what uh, experience we have uh, in other countries. And it is why for me, uh, one take, take what? Mm -hmm. Take uh, back or something right. like that mm -hmm. uh, is. Uh, how we can develop sharing experiences, documenting best practices. It is not that what happened in Estonia will be the same in Senegal or in Cote d'Ivoire. No same level, no same people, no same equipment, culture, all these things. But it is important to share what has happened. And you take what is relevant to you. But I think this exchange is something very important. The transfer of technology, maybe what you are referring uh, to the frontier of Rwanda, you have used a tool which can be uh, really relevant for other countries, for other situations, or maybe the almost same situation. Now, this is also can be something, the sharing issue sharing of experience seems to me also mm -hmm. uh, something we need to work on uh, the regulation it's good to to do i am very happy with all the thing i am hearing on digital technology but countries need also to work work on their legislation mm -hmm. uh, if not maybe everybody will do what they want but this is also another domain where you can have exchanges, partnership with others who have done it and uh, can help the countries. Uh, my last point will be that uh, let us try to, at least with the people here, mm -hmm. try to see what we can have as a, a step forward. And uh, I will maybe uh, use the opportunity to have these excellent people on the panel to going back home, maybe contact you, discuss with you, because it is a domain I think we can uh, learn a lot, but we can gain a lot by developing it in, in, in the country. Thank you so much, Awa. I think that was the purpose of this uh, session, um, and I would be delighted if you know it, it will serve its purpose. So, we are at time. I uh, understand. So, um, and I will not try to kind of summarize this very rich discussion. Um, but I really very much enjoyed that. You know, um, uh, hearing from very diverse, you know, perspectives, but but all moving towards one goal. And I think, and you used at the beginning. The term I liked. You talked about the beauty of living in the digital age. Was that is that right? Did I get you right there? And I thought, yeah, that's a very very nice phrase, right? Um, but our whole discussion was about making sure that 
this beauty of living in the digital age is really experienced by everyone, right? And we know that it's not yet the case. We know that, you know, uh, there is no digital connectivity everywhere and, and, you know, we are not there yet in, in using all these tools, but that's the goal, right? Um, that everyone uh, on this planet will, will experience uh, this beauty. And then I think there were two topics maybe that, that, you know, were like a threat throughout the discussions. One was trust. And it is interesting for me that we know, as we are discussing, you know, digital health and we are discussing AI, I mean, you know, the most advanced technology tools, we are actually also coming back to a very basic but very important human value. You know, that is the foundation for all of that. And, and it is not just the technology, but we, we need to build the trust so that, that we can really use that to, to, to its full um, potential. Um, and other very basic uh, human values like equity and solidarity are also behind what, what we are discussing here because only then um, will all these uh, benefits be shared. And uh, the other term that was um, running like a threat to all the discussions was partnership, including your, your last statement, our, because that's what it is, um, I think, all about. This partnership between you know, global organizations like WHO as, as the lead organization, um, other um, international organizations, in, including, you know, emerging ones um, like like IDER, the private sector, um, you know, ministries, governments around the world, civil society. That is the partnership we need. Parliamentarians, legislators, um, we we need this this full partnership um, to achieve that. And um, then, as we indicated earlier, you know, what what Amandeep also said is that you know, in collaboration with the World Health Summit. It is our goal that, that we kind of institute discussions like this, you know, on a regular basis and every year, in a sense, we, we come back and, and take stock a little bit, you know, where we are in achieving these goals with the kind of first or the next important milestone, 2030, we are, we are moving towards, because we also need some kind of accountability, if you like, you know, that, that there is accountability on whether we are really getting closer to our goals and achieving um, our goals. Um, we will be able to, to report then about, you know, many um, breakthroughs and advances in science and in research. And, and, and I'm, I'm mentioned some of those. Um, and I think, you know, let's, let's keep that uh, moving um, and make that a kind of, uh, you know, process so that, that we can check on each other building these partnerships, see whether we are moving in the right direction. But thank you all so much for, for this um, great conversation. Um, thank you so much, Anne and Ricardo, for joining us um, thank you. Um, online. I hope to see both of you in person again uh, very soon. Um, and also for the panelists here, I trust that there could be a little bit of an opportunity to exchange and you know build further partnerships uh, following this discussion. Thank you so much, all of you, to, to participate in, in, in the discussion in this session. Thanks for fantastic contributions from the panelists. Um, all the best. Yeah. Maybe as a reminder, <laughs> because um, I really think.